Join the conversation. Join the conversation. You're with Cape Talk. And I, I just love 9.30 or just after 9.30 on a Friday because I get to sit in the class and I, I get to learn so much from our, uh, our teacher. And our teacher, of course, every Friday just after 9.30, Dr. Chris Smith, the Chair of Science at the University of Cambridge, the Naked Scientist. And uh, we ask him questions and he answers those questions, the kind of stuff that keeps us up at night. Uh, and a whole lot of questions in for him. Welcome, Dr. Chris Smith. Uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, morning, Clarence. How are you? I'm good, thank you. There's some rain on its way this weekend, and I believe you've had a really hot June. What's July been like thus far? Well, this is the interesting thing, that the world celebrated its hottest day ever this week, and the UK celebrated its, if you can call it that, hottest June, although it was a, a month of two halves because some of it was extremely hot and then other bits of it were really quite cold. And we're, we're having this bizarre situation. We're doing that thing about talking about the weather, aren't we? But we're having this bizarre thing at the moment where it is the, the peak of summer, allegedly, and then we're getting some really hot days, but really quite cold nights as well so it'll go down to you really need to put a jumper on in the evening it's it's it's, it's actually quite like kind of outback type weather where the sun goes down and suddenly the temperature plummets normally it's it's more humid and it stays hotter into the evening so it's really bizarre but it, it does look like we're going for a promising weekend it's going to be 28 degrees today and then probably 29 tomorrow and sunday probably a bit of rain i should think knowing us but uh, hopefully it, it'll it'll stay good over the weekend Let's stay on the topic of, of, of weather. We've had a conversation about the weather, some climate change denialists were very actively engaging us this past week. Uh, they, they say that we've had periods of, of ice and we've had periods of higher, uh, of higher sea levels in, in the past. And this is just a natural kind of process. And we were trying to understand how our contribution as human beings and greenhouse gases uh, had further complicated matters. Can you help? Yeah, sure. It's not wrong to say that over its 4,500 million year lifetime, the Earth has had many, many departures and very radical departures in its climate. There have been periods of intense heat. There have been periods of intense cold when the Earth was like a giant snowball in space. And at the moment, we are in a pre fairly pleasant uh, temperature condition. But that is changing. Now, Let's divide this into two parts. The part that came before what the Earth used to do and why we're worried now. What the Earth used to do was to go through cycles of warming and cooling. And these would occur on what we call geological periods. So geological timescales spanning thousands to millions of years. We would have ice ages and then we would have warm spells. As recently as 30 million years ago, there were no polar ice caps, for example, the Oligocene-Eocene boundary. There, there were such high global temperatures that all the ice melted everywhere. But since then, of course, we've had ice ages. We had the last one, which ended about 10,000 years ago. And since then, things have warmed up. We should now be going into another ice age again, but temperatures are climbing, and that's why people are worried. What drove those changes? Well, a range of factors. One of them is that the Earth is not circular in its orbit, so its distance from the Sun is not constant. The Earth also wobbles on its axis as it spins a bit. This is called precession. And this also affects energy input to the planet. The Sun also doesn't have a static output of energy. Over its lifetime, the Sun has warmed up as it's aged. So that's changed the temperature input to the earth and the sun also has a solar cycle over a, a decade or so you have a sunspot cycle where the sun goes through periods of more intense and less intense radiation sometimes more prolonged periods of suppressed solar activity and when you integrate all of those inputs to the earth together with other factors on earth like geology for instance India used to be down where Antarctica is and it migrated all the way up over the Indian Ocean, slammed into the Asian continent, pushed up the Himalayas and the arrival of the Himalayas about 60 million years ago pulled loads of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and that plunged the planet into the deep freeze. So all those factors are coming to play as well and when you bring all that together you get these long variations in climate driven by natural factors. But what's different this time is that in the last 200 years or so, since the Industrial Revolution, steam engines, our exploitation of fossil fuels in a dramatically escalated way, this has contributed to about a trillion tonnes of carbon dioxide 
in the atmosphere. Yes, you did hear that correctly, a trillion tonnes. We're pumping out something in the region of 30 to 40 billion tonnes of CO2 every single year. This has an effect of warming the planet. Why does it warm the planet? Because when light shines through the atmosphere, it normally does, it, it's like light shining through a window. The atmosphere is transparent to light and heat normally. It then hits the ground, warms the ground up a bit and then lots of that energy bounces back off into space and is lost into space and keeps the earth cool. But if you put something in the way of that energy going back out into space, in other words you put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which can absorb infrared or heat energy, you then have a warmer layer in, against the earth which means the, ter the surface temperature is higher than it would otherwise be. And as you add more CO2 and more water, in fact, to the atmosphere, you get a, an intensification of this effect. And so what we've done is to effectively wrap the Earth in a blanket, a blanket of CO2, but it escalates temperatures. And the temperatures are climbing steadily because of this effect. So where we should be going into another ice age now, geologically, in fact, temperatures are climbing. And we think that's because of anthropogenic or man-made global warming and that's because of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So our priority is to try to reduce the amount of CO2 we're adding to the atmosphere, so we're sweeping less dirt under the carpet. That's the short-term goal, so make our lives more sustainable, and long-term we look at how we mitigate the effects that's going to have on climate, on rainfall, and therefore on the biosphere, our ability to live here on Earth. I don't expect it to settle the dispute, but thank you for empowering us to have the debates. Now let's go to the voice note and let's find out what's there. Good morning. This is Mary Debrick from Somerset West. We have a question. When they pump trillions of gallons of oil out from underneath the earth, do they leave a hole behind? What happens to that hole? Thank well, lovely you. question. The answer to this one is that oil is not sitting underground in a big lake, and nor is gas. It's not like there's a bubble in the earth and it's filled with oil. Oil is found in porous rock. It's a bit like a sponge, and if you squeeze the sponge then you can get the water out. It's similar. The rocks have lots of holes. Those holes are filled with oil. And so, yes, there's a cavity, but it's not one giant bubble. It's lots of tiny cavities, which over a vast oil or gas field add up to a big volume. So when you displace the oil out of the ground, you're not leaving a hole behind because the way we get the oil out, although it is under pressure to start with, to get the, the exploit, to exploit the, the, the well properly, you have to put something in to push the oil out. And they use various chemicals which are water-based because oil is less dense than water. So the water sits under the oil and pushes the oil out the top of the well. It's called mud in the trade. So they push something back into the holes in the rock to displace the oil outwards. So there isn't a massive great hole down there. There are lots of tiny holes in the rock, like a sponge. And when you get the oil out, you don't leave a void behind because you've put water or a water-based material in its place. If you give us a call on 021-446-0567, we'll prioritise your call. Barris has used that number. Barris in Bloberg, go ahead for the Naked Scientist. Good morning, Chris. I'm just curious to know, um, the Adam's apple, I always thought it was only males that had it, but it seems like females also have it. Now, what does it do, first of all? And secondly, if you had to have it, if you had a pronounced one, you had to have it uh, removed or reduced, what do the consequences of that be? Hi, Barris. Well, the Adam's apple is the laryngeal prominence. It's, it's the larynx. And if you were to cut open the throat and look in there, what you would see is what we call a bifurcation. It's like an upside down letter Y. And at the top, would, where the stem of the Y upside down would be, is the root of your tongue. And then the tube divides. And there's a tube that goes down the back, backwards, one arm of the Y, which is your esophagus, which goes down to your stomach. And the front facing tube goes down into your lungs and when you swallow you've got a structure that uh, at the back of the uh, throat that can guide food and other things you swallow around the opening to your um, throat so you don't inhale what you try to swallow it's an it's an amazing bit of anatomy when you when you see it and if you then go down into the air pipe the tube the trachea down on one of those arms of the y a bit further down you see a fold of tissue it's, like, it's almost as though you've got your hands in front of you with the nails pointing upwards and you've brought the two index fingers together. And those, that's what the folds look like in there. And where your fingernails are and your two hands put together, that's where the front of those folds attach and that's where your Adam's apple is. And they then attach at the back as well. And those are your vocal cords, vocal folds. And they are muscular tissue and they have the nerve supply to them. And as you 
uh, activate the nerves, you contract the muscles, and this pulls the vocal folds apart or brings them together. And this has the effect of creating puffs of air. So as you're breathing out, you can make the air oscillate by opening and closing the vocal folds because you cause pressure differences in the air, which causes a rush of air and then a closure and a rush of air. And that is the source of vibrations that we then modulate in our mouths and by moving our throat, our tongues around and moving our cheek muscles and the, the lips in order to produce sounds and speech. And the reason men sound different to women is because under the influence of male hormones, we have what's called sexual dichotomy. Men and women develop differently. Different body parts respond to those hormones, the male hormones or female hormones, differently and produce a change in anatomy. Now, in women, it's obvious when you have a high level of estrogen, the fat pads, which are on the chest where nipples are, the fat pads beneath those nipples become more pronounced and they become breasts. And also hair changes, skin also changes in men with testosterone women also have testosterone but men have much much more you also produce region specific changes hair patterns change muscle patterns change but also some cartilaginous structures like your adam's apple change and this has the effect of lengthening the vocal cords if you have longer vocal cords just as a longer organ pipe has a lower resonant frequency which is why you get your low notes from your organ pipe or, or a, an instrument that's very long has a low note because it has a low resonant frequency because the vocal prominence the laryngeal prominence is farther away and the focal folds are longer in a man because of that change in anatomy you get a lower resonant frequency and a deeper voice than in women who have a smaller part of that anatomy and th this this is why when you go through puberty and that structure changes its shape the voice breaks in inverted commas it's the vocal folds becoming longer and this has the effect of changing the, the vocal characteristic the Naked Scientist uh, is with us every Friday. Your calls on 021 446 0567. WhatsApp questions uh, 072 567 1567. Let's go to the WhatsApp line, Joe. What's next? Good morning, Cape Talk team. Um, I've got a quick question actually for Dr. Chris Smith or Naked Scientist when he's back on TV. How is it that we have different temperatures during the day? Like if we have a nice sunny day, why is one day 30 and the next day 25? How does te the temperature change when we kind of gain the same distance from the sun? I guess that's Jason from Brock and Folio. Well, you could argue, why does the temperature change since we're the same distance from the sun between day and night? Because between day and night, the distance that the Earth is from the sun hasn't changed at all. But what has changed is the amount of sunshine that is reaching the Earth's surface. If it's night time, the sun's on the other side of the planet, so there's no light hitting the Earth's surface, and therefore the temperature of the air around you and the Earth's surface beneath your feet is going to be lower, so it feels colder. When it's daytime, there's more solar input, and therefore it's warmer. So one of the biggest drivers is how much sunshine is hitting you between one day and the next. Because if it's a cloudy day, clouds cut down the amount of heat which is reaching you because they're highly reflective. They're like mirrors in the sky and they bounce lots of the sunlight back into space. So less reaches you at the ground surface and therefore you feel colder. That's part of it. The other part of it is that air masses move around the planet's surface driven by pressure differences. And if you have areas of high pressure, they will push air towards areas of low pressure. Also, the planet is spinning. So there are movements, mass movements of air around the planet, which are the jet streams. And when you bring all of these factors together, you will end up with situations where there might be patches or, or masses of warm air, which end up moving from an area of high pressure to an area of lower pressure and making you warm up. There may be the reverse effect going on. So the, the models that we have to predict the weather are very good now, at understanding how this works, and they model the planet and can tell us what the temperatures are going to be, which is how you get these readouts. But it's all down to how much energy is on the reaching the planet's surface, therefore on the planet's surface, radiating up at you, and also getting transferred into the air around you to make it uh, warmer for you. The humidity, the amount of water in the air, will also make a difference to how how effectively you lose heat, and therefore also how hot you do or don't feel. Another question in for the Naked Scientist via WhatsApp. Let's take a listen, Joe. Hi, Clarence. Uh, so, Dr. Chris, uh, when, when they refer to singing, they talk about singing from the chest and then they do talk about singing from the head. How, how does that happen? 
one of the most amazing things I saw, I went to a university in Jeddah and it was the winter enrichment se season and they get people in from around the world to come and talk to the scientists there and tell them what they're up to. And I was one of the people who was talking and doing things, but the next night after me was this amazing team of Mongolian throat singers. Uh, and it was the most awesome spectacle to both see and listen to. So what these people managed to do is to produce, and if you want to look this up on, on YouTube, uh, throat singing, you'll see if you haven't heard it, you'll see what I mean. It's just amazing. And these are people who are able to sustain very low rumbling noises with their throats that they then modulate and and turn into a song. It's just incredible. But it's all about, if you ask an experienced singer, they will tell you that it's all about airflow and, and control of the airflow. And really good singers know how to get the air flowing in a very regular, forceful way so that they're able to sustain the same very, very tightly controlled set of frequencies constantly or for the duration they want to. And they do it by pushing air right down deep into their lungs. And then they, they learn and train themselves to use all of the muscles around the chest in order to get very good control of the airflow. They can produce a lot of airflow when they need to produce very loud notes. And that's what they're modulating with their vocal cords or a uh, very long sustained delivery of air. They also increase their lung capacity by doing this sort of vocal training and becoming very good singers. You do end up with a higher lung capacity. And that also means you've effectively got a bigger set of bags for your bagpipes, which is your voice. Now, a question in um, from Edmund. He says, if Twitter collapses, as we all hope, what happens to all the data they gathered over the years? That's the question. Well, there's an old saying that uh, once it's into the digital domain, the detritus will follow you around forever. There are effectively digital footprints left indefinitely. There are archives of everything that's ever been said and done on the internet. And I, I've done this myself. I was intrigued to see, well, what, what did the first ever Naked Scientist website look like when we built it back in 2001? I had a vague memory of what we'd done and what it looked like. And you can go onto various websites which have snapshots of pretty much everything that was ever published and you can find them. So I would very strongly suspect that there are archives of all of those tweets of data that was put there somewhere and I don't think it will ever disappear. You'll always be able to find it, whether it's in the same curated accessible format that it currently is, who knows. Um, but I, I, I wonder if it's one of those entities that's a bit too big to fail, if you know what I mean. It's, it's too big, it's got too much of a subscribership and one wonders therefore whether because the data is the value, the people who take part in it, whether um, someone would step in and, uh, and buy it. I suspect they, they almost certainly would. Uh, a message in from Etienne in Campsbay, just in response to one of your answers. This was the single best explanation of global warming I've heard so far. This is great information for arguing for action. Thank you. And then a message in about Springtide. Uh, the National Sea Rescue Institute uh, has asked us to be careful around the beach this weekend. What is the spring Springtide and why can it be dangerous? Right. OK. Well, we have both spring and neap tides. And these happen every two weeks, and it's to do with the moon or lunar cycle. So here's the, the reason. The Earth has a moon, and as the moon goes round the Earth, and this takes about a month for the moon to go in one complete lap, the Earth turns inside the moon, and as the moon is going round the Earth, it will of course have periods of the moon's orbit where the moon lines up with the sun. So in other words, if you look up in the sky, you're going to see the moon and the sun in line with each other in the sky at the same time. And that will happen when the moon and the sun are on the same side of the Earth, but it will also happen when the moon and the sun are on opposite sides of the Earth. They're in a straight line. They're just on opposite sides of the Earth. Why does that matter? Well, the moon pulls water on the Earth's surface towards itself. And that's why you have a high tide where the Earth faces the moon. You also have another high tide on the other side of the Earth, away from the moon, because there 
the water is feeling the least gravitational attraction and the moon has pulled the water and the earth on the other side towards itself a bit. So the water heaps up in two bulges, one facing the moon, the other on the opposite side of the earth, away from the moon. And that's why there are two high tides a day. So as the earth turns, it turns through those bulges that have been made by the moon and you have high tide number one and then you go to a low tide and then 12 hours later you have another high tide. Now, when the sun is also in line with the moon, you have an additional gravitational effect in that direction. So you have not just the moon pulling the water towards itself, but you also have the sun helping. And so you have an even bigger tide when that is the case. So that is a spring tide because you've got the moon and the sun pulling in the same direction. Once you go a bit off that axis, so the moon has come round on its orbit a bit further, now you've got the moon, let's, let's think of a clock face, you've got the sun at three o'clock and the moon at six o'clock, now they're not helping each other. The sun's pulling a bit in one direction, the moon's pulling the water in the other direction. So as a result, there's less water to go round and heap up in one place. So although the moon will still produce a high tide where that patch of the earth is, it's a smaller high tide than when the two were lined up together. And that is a neap tide. So that's why you have a cycle of spring and neap tides every couple of weeks and the spring tides are higher tides than normal, the neap tides lower tides than normal. We're going to have to rest the dead. Thank you. Big thank you, Dr. Chris Smith, Chair of Science at the University of Cambridge. The Naked Scientist, our interaction with him every Friday. So the moon and the sun is tugging at the sea and you don't want to go with the flow. Be careful out there.